So it's my happy uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. She was appointed Director General of ICMR and Secretary of the Department of Health Research in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for the Government of India in August 2015. Prior to that, she was director of the National Institute for Research in Tuberculosis in Chennai for three years. After completing her MBBS at the Armed Forces Medical College in Pune, and MD in Pediatrics at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, her additional training included a fellowship in neonatal, natal, uh, neonatal, I can't talk to it, uh, neonatology and pediatric pulmonology at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles at USC, and a research fellowship in the Department of Pediatric Respiratory Diseases at the University of Leicester in the UK. Dr. Swaminathan joined the TB Research Center in Chennai in 1992. She served for two years as coordinator for neglected tropical diseases for the WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases. And she spent the last 24 years working in the area of health research. Her research interests include pediatric and adult tuberculosis, epidemiology and pathogenesis, and the role of nutrition and HIV-associated TB. Among her many accomplishments, she's noted worldwide for her groundbreaking work on tuberculosis treatment and prevention, and you'll hear more about that today in her talk. She holds many professional memberships, including in the International Union Against TB and Lung Diseases, and she chaired the HIV section of that organization from 2009 to 2011, the International Scientific Advisory Expert Group for the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Global TB, and the Third World Organization of Women Scientists. She also serves as a member of the UNAIDS Expert Panel and the Scientific and Technical Advisory Group, WHO Stop TB. Dr. Swaminathan has the distinction of being awarded the President of India's Gold Medal at the undergraduate level for the Best All-Round Outgoing Student of the Year, the ICMR Shanika Oration Award, and the Tamil Nadu Science and Technology Award. She's a fellow of three of India's scientific academies and has over 230 publications in international and national journals and several book chapters. Please join me in giving a warm Bloomberg School welcome to Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, it's great to see all of you here. Many are uh, old friends and uh, a lot of new ones, I hope, after this visit. So, you know, tuberculosis is such a vast topic. It's, it's always very difficult to decide what to talk about. And if I started trying to cover everything, we'd be here all day. But um, essentially, what I want to do is to touch on different aspects of the disease and essentially highlight what we know, but a lot of what we don't know, and uh, uh, which obviously are the future uh, research challenges for us. So I bring greetings from the Indian Council of Medical Research. This is the oldest research organization in the country, much older than the NIH or even the Medical Research Council of the UK. So the British actually set up the Indian Research Council before they set up their own one <laughs> in the UK. And we have, uh, just like the NIH, uh, in system of intramural institutes, 32 of them spread across the country. One of them is a tuberculosis research center where I used to work, and uh, a, a big program of extramural research support. And it's the largest funder of biomedical research in India um, across uh, academia, universities, <clears throat> medical schools, and so on. Um, now, of course, uh, you're familiar with uh, the WHO NTB strategy. Uh, India has also signed up to this. So this is going to be a tall order because we're talking about 95% reduction in TB deaths and a 90% reduction in, in TB incidence by 2035 and, uh, and pretty uh, ambitious milestones for 2025. Uh, the three major components of the strategy, the first one is to look more at patient-centered care, uh, both diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Um, of course, TB is a disease of poverty. I think we have to keep that in mind. And so TB cannot really be tackled unless you also tackle all the other things that go with poverty, uh, 
So universal health coverage and other kinds of social support systems that tide people through ill health. And then the third important one, which obviously that you know we're more excited about, is the is the research and innovation. And as part of that, um, we are now launching what's called going to be called the India TB Research Consortium, that's going to try and bring together partners, both nationally but also global partnerships for people who are interested in in answering the top you know scientific questions in TB. So in terms of what's uh, in the pipeline, there has been progress in the last few years. So you know, pre-2000, it was like pretty much all gloom and doom in terms of new tools or new drugs or new vaccines. But now, you know, we see, if you look at diagnostics, there have been new, especially molecular diagnostics developed, the most uh, well-known of which, of course, is the, is the gene expert or the cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification test, but there are other molecular tools like the line probe assay that have been validated and endorsed by WHO. And the hope is that by 2020, we should have a point-of-care rapid and sensitive uh, test. So one of the problems has been that TB diagnosis is dependent on producing sputum or on one of the body's uh, you know, fluids, and the sensitivity of microscopy is you know, being less than 50%, but other methods also suffer from a problem. Um, and if you want to go and screen people in a community, you need something which is highly sensitive and, and hopefully with fairly good specificity. We also have countries like India where more than half the population has latent infection because everybody gets exposed to TB at some time or the other. And so it's really hard to think about interventions unless you can have a test that can differentiate. Uh, so 90% of people with latent infection stay healthy throughout their lives. And obviously, their own immune systems are able to control TB. But less than 10% will go on to develop active disease. So who are those 10%? Uh, we don't know. At the moment, we don't have a test to identify those people. So that's a high priority. And of course, drug susceptibility testing, because like any other infection, uh, unless you know the drug susceptibility, you're not testing with the right combination. You're not treating with the right combination of drugs. You're not going to have a good outcome. And so far, it's all been standardized therapies. And that's what WHO has always advocated. And that's had its own problems, as we've now realized. So a rapid drug susceptibility test uh, would also help in the, in the fight against TB. In terms of drugs, the good news is that we do have two new drugs for TB. Rifampicin was the last drug for TB, developed in the 1970s. And after that, we had nothing. But in 2012 and 13, we've had bedaquiline which is made by a company called Janssen, and a drug called Delaminid, made by a Japanese company called Otsuka. And both these drugs have novel mechanisms of action, which is a good thing. They're not using the same mechanism of action as, a, as the old TB drugs. So these are now in clinical trials in different combinations. And so there's a lot of hope now that you can actually start not only treating MDR and XDR better, but also shortening treatment for TB. Then we have um, a short three-month regimen for latent TB infection. So traditionally, it was isoniazid given for six to nine months. But now we have a 12-dose regimen. And again, uh, we're looking forward to uh, perhaps reducing treatment duration to four months, though all the trials done so far have not been very promising. But there is a trial going on in Chennai in our institute, which shows pretty good results with a four-month regimen. So perhaps we could have a, that includes a fluoroquinolone in addition to the four standard TB drugs. There are trials now uh, going on, like the STREAM study for MDR-TB that are trying to reduce treatment duration to nine months or even six months, which, is, which would be really revolutionary considering that currently we treat MDR-TB for at least 24 months. Vaccines, not such good news. Um, the vaccines that have been tried so far have not really been shown to have great efficacy. Um, but there are many vaccine candidates at various stages of development. And uh, one vaccine that will go into phase three trials, hopefully in India very soon, which is a recombinant BCG vaccine developed by Dr. Stefan Kaufman's group in Germany, which has a deletion in the, in the listeriolysin gene, which actually makes, uh, makes it more or at least as effective but safer 
than BCG because it's a live attenuated vaccine. And the concern with BCG was that in immunodeficient children, particularly those with HIV, um, that uh, they were not so common, but there are cases where the BCG starts replicating and then you get disseminated BCG disease of which children were dying. So the uh, aim is to develop a, more, a safer BCG vaccine that would have as good, as good if not better efficacy. In terms of uh, the TB situation in India, we unfortunately have the largest burden in the world, so quarter of the world's cases. Now this is an estimate, this number, um, and recently as data that's been coming out of the private sector is telling us that this is much higher. It may be closer to three and a half, maybe four million, we don't know, but we're going to start a prevalence survey very soon. And hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have a handle on the true burden of the disease. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about how challenging that is as well. Again, these are the estimated number of deaths, probably a little bit higher. The global burden of disease puts the deaths at half a million per year, so it's probably somewhere between a quarter and a half million deaths, which is way too high. And uh, HIV-associated TB, we, our HIV prevalence is not so high, luckily. So our population prevalence of HIV is less than 0.3%. And we have pockets where we have high prevalence, some areas where there's HIV co-infection up, up to 10, 12, 15%, but most other areas in India, HIV co-infection is like two, three, less than 5%. MDR-TB, we have about 100,000 new cases emerging every year. 60,000 is just among the notified cases. So that's the new cases and the deaths. So if you look at deaths per day, that's really high. And uh, untreated cases are the main source of spread in the community, a huge economic burden, and studies have shown that uh, up to 40% of annual household expenditure uh, in the families that get TB goes towards seeking care. So it really drives people in, further into poverty. And MDR-TB uh, is emerging as a challenge, particularly in hot spots of high transmission, like in the urban slums of Mumbai. Now, this slide basically uh, puts together data from a number of surveys that have been done in India. So, like I said, we have not had a national prevalence survey. We're going to, we're going to launch one now. But essentially, you can see these are the different surveys done between in the last, uh, you know, five, six years. And there is heterogeneity. This is prevalence per 100,000 population. And you can see these are uh, places in Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the... Um, I would say, least developed states of the country. So, you know, 450 to 500 per 100,000. And then you have other places. This is Bangalore, <coughs> Varda, Chennai is in between. And this is near Chandigarh, which is a probably very high socioeconomic, uh, well-developed area. You can see that's the prevalence. And the pool prevalence from all these studies is about 350 per 100,000. Another interesting point that's come out of all these studies is that in every one of these surveys, the rural-urban prevalence ratio has been anywhere from one and a half to two and a half times. So consistently, rural areas have higher rates of TB than urban, which is not intuitive because you would think that transmission is more in, in urban areas. But the disease prevalence is higher. Uh, however, the force of transmission is probably lower because annual risk of TB, TB infection is lower in rural than, than in urban areas. Possible reasons could be longer duration of illness because of diagnostic delays, lack of access, and so on. Whereas here in urban areas, there's a higher opportunity for transmission, but possibly people get to the health facilities much faster. <coughs> the survey that we did in Chennai, actually, if you just focus on this graph here, you can first thing you see is the difference between men and women in rates of TB. This is a biological uh, difference, it's not an issue of case finding or of access to care or anything like that, and the reasons are not well understood. Post-menopausally, you can see the rates go up in women. And the other thing we see is that the age group of between 45 and 65, almost 1% of men in Chennai at that point of time had culture-positive TB. Another survey done in Gujarat also brought out an interesting finding about treatment-seeking behavior of people. So if you look at this pie chart, you find that there was only a small group of people who were um, 
the light green, 11% of people who had sought care and who were on appropriate treatment. Uh, a third of them had sought care, not on treatment, they were smear positive. A smaller proportion had sought care, they were culture positive only. About a third of people ignored their symptoms and about 10% did not recognize the illness. So what it means is that the th a third with no symptoms, another third of 35% who had ignored the symptoms, another 17% who were not on treatment. So even of those who sought care, only 40% were under treatment. And there were so a lot of people walking around in the community <clears throat> with disease that's infectious, they are culture positive or even smear positive for, for TB, but not on treatment. And that's the reason why transmission is ongoing. So this is important because when we think about active case finding strategies, then we need to uh, think about how do we pick up these people who say they don't have symptoms and people who have symptoms but they're not severe enough for them to seek care. Okay, so this, I've already talked about the mortality and we are in the process now with uh, the Public Health Foundation of India and the IHME, the Institute of Health Metrics, evaluation to actually make disease burden estimates by state. So in terms of the epidemiology of TB in India, the, the questions that remain are, what's the true community prevalence? And other surveys in other countries have shown the true burden to be much higher than expected. And like I said, some of the models where the private sector has been notifying cases to the public sector, because in India, the private sector plays an important role in healthcare uh, for everything. So about 80% of people would first go to a private physician and probably end up with a public health sector when they're not getting better or they're found to have, uh, dis you know, they run out of resources. And then what are the pockets of high prevalence, like tribal areas we know, higher prevalence, urban slums, and then within the population, uh, the men, the age group 45 to 65 I showed you, have consistently in all the surveys been shown to have the highest prevalence. What about determinants of TB? Now you think um, determinants and the first thing that comes to mind is HIV, right? Because that's what in the last 20 <coughs> years, uh, you know, a lot of the work done particularly in Africa has shown. But really when you look at urban slums and that's Dharavi in, um, in Mumbai, you find that all the factors like overcrowding and pollution and undernutrition and ignorance and then health system factors where even when pa patients go to doctors, they don't use the right diagnostics, they do not uh, prescribe the appropriate treatment. But in India, the, the most important risk factor for TB is, is undernutrition. This is global data published by Knut Londroth and others from the WHO. With, when they put together data from different countries, you find a consistent uh, log linear relationship between TB incidence and reducing BMI. And when we analyze our own um, National Family Health Survey data, we find that 50% of TB cases, both in men and women, can be attributed to undernutrition. And this was a paper published from Chhattisgarh, which is a very rural and tribal uh, state of India, which showed that even after TB treatment, the BMI, both in <coughs> women and men, really didn't come up to 18.5. So they are extremely malnourished, and in fact, some of the TB patients had BMIs of 11 and 12, which are considered inconsistent with life. So to, this brings us back to the point that uh, in addition to the biomedical interventions for TB, we need to address things like undernutrition, alcohol smoking, and air pollution. Indoor air pollution is still a huge problem in India. 70% of of rural households still use solid fuel, though this is now rapidly changing with the rollout of the LPG and overcrowding. And then, of course, you have occupational exposures. What about drug-resistant TB uh, burden? Of course, again, the burden is high. The um, National TB Resistance Survey is going on at the moment, so we'll have data by the end of the year, but these are data that Again, statewide surveys, not a national survey, but essentially showing pretty much that MDR-TB among new cases was about 2 to 3 percent, and among previously treated cases was about 15 to 17 percent. But extensively drug-resistant TB 
which is resistance to fluoroquinolones and uh, injectables in addition to rifampicin and INH, worryingly about 3 to 7% among MDR-TB. And, and quinolone resistance alone, ofloxacin in this case, is, uh, is much higher. And that's because of the use of ofloxacin and other quinolones by uh, doctors to treat all sorts of infections. So you see that the, uh, the rate of quinolone resistance was um, about 10% and 14% in new and previously treated cases. We also have uh, resistance to other drugs, not so well studied. So people are focused on isoniazid and rifampicin, but data from our program shows that you have a lot of poly resistance. You have streptomycin resistance and then combinations of streptomycin INH and with ethambutol and so on. And the, I don't know if I have slides on the expert project, but uh, we had a, a project where we had put in gene expert machines in now in nine cities in India. And anybody could refer patients, children, any sample from children to them. And the shocking thing was, which the pediatricians did not expect, was to find that about 7% of children uh, of about 10,000 children who were studied till that point of time had rifampicin resistance or MDR-TB. And uh, it was thought that children did not have MDR-TB, that MDR-TB was an adult phenomenon acquired because of uh, non-compliance. But the fact is that children usually get primary uh, transmission. So the more MDR you have in the community, the more you're going to see in children. Now. Treatment outcomes of MDR-TB are not good, and 48% globally, and in India also success rates around 50%. Now again, a little bit improving, but high death and default rates, and partly the reason for high default is the long course of treatment and the fact that patients have to be on injectables for six months, which is really very difficult and very painful. Uh, we also looked at outcomes of patients with INH resistance versus those who had a sensitive organisms treated with the uh, standard category two dots regimen and find that, I mean, not surprisingly, that patients with INH resistance had much lower cure rates. There's hardly any trials done in, in groups of patients with INH resistance or polyresistant TB, so that's very much needed. And also we need to do the drug susceptibility testing for all drugs, not just for rifampicin, as is currently being done. And there is a trial now going on in Chennai where we're looking at uh, a fully oral regimen with levofloxacin for uh, INH-resistant TB. So uh, there are different ways in which drug resistance develops. Of course, uh, you know, poor prescription practices and non-compliance is an important factor. And if you're already infected with an INH-resistant organism, much more likelihood of developing MDR-TB. That's been shown in multiple studies now. Subtherapeutic drug concentrations also drive resistance. That's not has, has not been as well studied or well understood because there haven't been that many pharmacokinetic studies, but our studies uh, have shown that, for example, for rifampicin, that 83% of patients treated in the public sector had subtherapeutic rifampicin levels. In addition to that, you, the mycobacteria have something called the efflux pumps, where, which get activated on exposure to these drugs. And they are then able to pump rifampicin, INH, even quinolones out of the um, bacterial cell. And they, so they become tolerant. So you have a bunch of bacteria that become tolerant to these drugs that continue to survive. And perhaps bacteria within lesions, within cavity, cavities and in parts of the body which are not the, where the drugs don't uh, get to therapeutic levels. So these are uh, multiple factors, again, to do with drug dosing and drug regimens that might drive uh, bugs towards drug resistance. Then, of course, transmission. So if you ha we know now that some strains of uh, mycobacteria <coughs> transmitted more easily. This was, in fact, described a long time ago uh, in Chennai, well before uh, sequencing or any of that was available. They described something called the the South Indian strain, which was considered less virulent. And now we know that there are lineages and there are strains and that you have something called the East African Indian strain, which seems to be 
um, less susceptible to developing drug resistance than the Central Asian strain, or for the Beijing strain for that matter, which tends to develop uh, MDRTB very quickly. So the effect of the genotype of the MTB strain, the epistatic interactions, the compensatory mutations that develop, these are all now being better understood by the uh, with more and more availability of whole genome sequence data. And when we sequenced about 200 of these strains, the majority of the strains, because we're based in South India, were East African uh, Indian. And you can see that the red lines here are the rifampicin resistance. These were concentrated more in the, in the Central Asian strain rather than in the EAI strains. But, uh, but we need to do more work on that. And also, um, there have been studies done in other lineages of MTB which show that T cell epitopes are hyperconserved. So generally, it is believed that unlike HIV, for example, that mutations are not something that's uh, driving you know, changes in epitopes as far as MTB is concerned. But when we looked at our, the lineages that are common in India, that's lineage 1, 2, and 3, we found that there was actually escape uh, mutants developing. And a study of these 80 strains revealed that about 13% of known T cell epitopes were found to be mutated. And these are the corresponding antigens. And these are the functional classification of the, uh, the epitopes, which, you know, involving different pathways. So this is something, again, we're learning more as we're looking more into uh, not just sequence data, but functional data as well. But there's a lot more that really needs to be done in this, uh, in this area. Now, uh, so this is the gene expert machine. I don't know how many of you have seen this but it's now the standard for detection of rifampicin resistance. It covers uh, molecular beacons that target the RPOB gene, and so it covers most of the rifampicin resistance, <coughs> though it does miss geographically there are variations in that. The specificity is very good. The sensitivity varies depending on the specimen type and so on, but it is now recommended as a preferred diagnostic test, especially for smear negative TB, HIV TB, and in children. So, um, so this was a study, I think I mentioned, uh, yeah, this one, where I was talking about the children being tested by gene expert. And I'd, you may not be able to see this, but essentially, if you look at just CSF, for example, using expert, about 7% are positive for, uh, this is for detection, um, whereas the smear was positive in, in zero out of 500 specimens. Similarly, other fluids like pus, and uh, fine needle aspirations, you get very high positivity with the gene expert, much higher than the smear. So it's really a good uh, tool, not only to detect TB, but also to detect the fampicin resistance. Now, of course, there are other uh, tools that are being developed by the companies. There's one being developed by an Indian company that we are now evaluating. It's much smaller, it's battery operated, it's portable compared to the gene expert. It works on a chip and they've also been able to automate it to a large extent. Um, so we're hoping that you know, this could go out much more into the field and uh, be placed perhaps in primary health centers, whereas the, the expert machine actually needs air conditioning and it needs a proper lab environment. So um, certainly the molecular uh, tests are the way you know, things are moving as an alternative to culture. And there are also now work going on on quantitative measure of the MTB DNA as, a, you know, looking at cycle threshold. Uh, one of the problems here is because it detects DNA that you could also be detecting dead bacteria. So it's not a good test for follow-up. And so you need now tests which can distinguish viable and non-viable MTB. Of course, propidium monoazide uh, pretreatment, that's a well-known method, but whether that can actually be combined with some of these methods so that you know whether there are uh, live uh, bacteria or not. And uh, whole genome sequencing really is giving us much more information now than we had before. Earlier, it was very painful to do the phenotypic assays for each individual drug, but now with whole genome sequencing, you can <clears throat> immediately identify resistance mutations in a number of different drugs. So 
when we looked at, uh, we took 19 strains of MDR-TB and, and sequenced them, we could tell, you know, from that, that of seven ofloxacin-resistant isolates, only three are treatable probably with moxifloxacin because there are different mutations. So there's not complete cross-resistance. Similarly, if you had canamycin resistance, then five had a mutation that also out of nine that conferred cross-resistance to all the other injectables. So these were not going to work. Whereas normally what we would do in a standardized approach would be if the patient had failed on a canamycin reg regimen, they would get put on a capriomycin regimen without realizing that the patient might already have resistance to that. Similarly, we picked up mu novel mutations to linezolid as well as mutations to cyclosidine and so on. So while in the US, uh, I think every TB patient has their uh, specimen sent across to CDC and a whole genome sequence is done and you get the results back probably in a couple of days and uh, you would know exactly what drugs that patient would be sensitive. This is not possible in a country where you have two or three million TB patients every year. So, um, but, but still it just shows that molecular tests that can detect mutations, at least the common ones against all these drugs would go a long way in helping us. Unless of course we get to the point where we are treating now TB with a completely different set of new drugs. Similarly, there's been work on imaging, not much in India, but there has been work on imaging using PET CT scans, which uh, superimpose structural and functional data. And uh, so these kind of studies are showing us that granulomas in TB behave very uh, differently than what we would expect. So by, even while you're on treatment, there are granulomas that are healing and other granulomas that are actually getting activated. Gene expression profiles for biosignatures, again, both as diagnostic markers, but more importantly, to pre predict the progression of disease and to predict outcomes are, again, a hot topic for, for research. There, is a, there was a biosignature that was uh, developed and validated by the South African group, looking at a combination of 16 different genes, and that's something that uh, we need to test in other settings to see if that's going to be, uh, it's, if it's going to, you know, stand the scrutiny in other settings. So the, I think we'll skip over this. <clears throat> this is some work in Chennai I wanted to mention um, on heme oxygenase. Heme oxygenase is a stress response gene that's a potent antioxidant. It's expressed in various cell types and it neutralizes uh, neutralizes free heme. So when heme is released on oxidative damage, the heme oxygenase one really uh, acts as a protective mechanism. Now, this study was done uh, in partnership with uh, folks at the NIH who also looked at specimens from, from Brazil and found that this is healthy people, uh, latent infected people, patients with extrapulmonary TB and pulmonary TB, you can see that there's a clear difference in heme oxygenase levels between those who are latently infected or healthy and those who had active TB, and that these levels came down in people who had responded to treatment, but in people who had failed treatment, uh, the, these levels did not actually come down. And when you add uh, to this the matrix metalloproteinase 1, the MMP, one and combine levels of heme oxygenase 1 and MMP1, <clears throat> it has a good discrimination between active and latent TB, uh, you know, with a high sensitivity and specificity. But again, these sort of things uh, really need to be validated prospectively in larger studies to, to show whether this could. But if, if it could really, if we had a test that could distinguish latent and active TB, that would be extremely useful. So as I mentioned, we are working on a couple of things to evaluate these indigenous diagnostics for TB and MDR-TB. We're also working with a company which is looking at computer-aided X-ray reading because if you're going to do mass X-ray screening, you can't have radiologists or, or physicians reading all the X-rays. And then high-throughput methods like whole genome sequencing need to be simplified and there are people working on, on handheld methods actually. Uh, so perhaps in a couple of years we would have, we would be able to do whole genome sequencing even uh, much more simply. And then biomarkers, both for diagnosis and prediction. I think we'll skip this uh, 
this part and move on to this was more immunology but it was essentially to show that you know as we are understanding more about what's happening within the cell what pathways are being activated by m tuberculosis you can also think about additional treatments as adjunct therapies for tb so it's not just the antimicrobials that would kill the organism but if you could also manipulate the host immune response in this case for example by blocking five um, lipooxygenase with a drug like xyluton which is already available in the market and is used to treat asthma and this is uh, data from from Maya Barber and uh, and Bruno and Rade from NIH showing that in when they did this in mice that xyluton with the prostaglandin E2 administration uh, prevented the type 1 interferon induced exacerbation of TB so basically the the mice that were treated with poly ICLC all succumbed uh, to, to infection, whereas if you blocked it with 5-lipooxygenase uh, inhibitors, then those mice could survive. Okay, so what are the uh, research issues as far as treatment is concerned? Certainly we need... Uh, shorter, less toxic, and more acceptable regimens. I mean, six months for drug-sensitive TB, two years for MDR-TB is far too long. And as I mentioned, a fully oral regimen for MDR-TB would be very welcome, because at the moment we have to treat even small children who have MDR-TB with six months of very painful uh, injections. We, they should also be compatible with antiretrovirals, because a large proportion of patients worldwide have HIV co-infection. And one of the new uh, trials that is starting up now is called the STREAM study, which will test a combination of bedaquilin, the new drug, with other uh, existing drugs. And these are some of the drug candidates. Uh, rifapentine, of course, is not a new drug, but it's been uh, now combined with isoniazid, used more for prevention of TB. And there are uh, trials, especially PK studies going on. Bedaquilin is... Uh, now, the STREAM study is the phase three study for bedaquilin, and it's also go going into pediatric development. And delaminid and pretominid both belong to the same class. One is uh, by Otsuka, and the other belongs to TB Alliance, and these are undergoing multiple trials. The SQ109 is not really going anywhere. Sutezolid and tedizolid are uh, derivatives of the same group, linezolid group, and, but with less toxicity. And then, of course, you have the, the quinolones. Um, okay, this is about uh, TB meningitis, and I'll mention it briefly because we have this ongoing study now, collaboration with the Johns Hopkins, with uh, Amita Gupta and Kelly Dooley, essentially because uh, there really hasn't been many trials done for TBM, and this slide shows you that there are different standards of care in different countries using different duration and different combination of, of drugs. And a study done in Indonesia a couple of years ago showed that by giving high-dose intravenous rifampicin and uh, adding levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, you could actually reduce mortality by 50%. So this actually brought, and then there was some PK work done along with the study which showed that the penetration of rifampicin into the CSF is very low, um, and you're not really achieving the minimal inhibitory concentration in many uh, cases. And, uh, when you look at fluoroquinolone uh, and, and survival, and you look at the plasma AUC-MIC ratio, what you find is that people who had an optimal plasma AUC-MIC ratio had the best survival, and those where it was too high or too low did not do as well. So based on some of these studies now, we're just launching this TB meningitis trial in children in Pune and Chennai, which will look at at high dose rifampicin, of course, we are using it orally, not intravenously, and adding uh, levofloxacin. And it's going to be a, a, an eight week phase 2B study that will look at pharmacokinetics in great detail, but also look at clinical outcomes and microbiological outcomes to see if we can improve the uh, treatment outcomes of TB meningitis in children, which at the moment are very poor. So you have about a third of children who die, and another 30 to 40 percent who are left with pretty severe disability. So basically what 
you know, it, all these studies are bringing out now is that we have been uh, using TB drugs perhaps not at the optimal dosages that we should be using. They were based on trials, many of them conducted in the 70s and 80s. These were not accompanied by pharmacokinetic studies and so on. So we're learning that even with existing TB drugs, let alone the new TB drugs, we could actually optimize treatment by, by you know, increasing the dose. In the case of rifampicin, for example, there are many trials going on now which are using much higher doses of rifampicin than what, what we've been used to. So as I mentioned, there are other approaches apart from antimicrobial combinations, what are called now the host-directed therapies, which, uh, which are trying to stimulate the immune system in some way, either using vaccines or drugs. Um, one of these approaches is something that's been um, researched by Lalita Ramakrishnan, who was at Seattle and who's University of Washington now and moved to Cambridge, where she showed that this uh, concept of uh, efflux e pumps, if you inhibit the efflux pumps by, there are many efflux pump inhibitors, but a drug like verapamil, which again is a drug that's been used for many years to treat hypertension, it's a very safe drug, then you could actually uh, reduce uh, potentially treatment duration. Similarly, I showed you some data on leukotriene inhibitors and prostaglandin inhibitors or other drugs that would increase autophagy like metformin for example and there are valproic acid and other so that's the whole concept of repurposing drugs to to use them uh, as adjunct therapies and then there are some um, vaccines also where it's been suggested that they could be used as therapeutic vaccines along with anti-tb treatment so these are some of the host-directed therapies that have been suggested, including drugs like ibuprofen, COX-2 inhibitors, cholesterol-lowering drugs, diabetes drugs like metformin, uh, anticonvulsants like valproic acid, and so on. So I think we'll just move on. And metformin, there's been quite a bit published, quite a lot of interest in this. Uh, Amit Singhal from Singapore first published this paper um, retrospective study showing that of people who had diabetes and TB, those who were on metformin had fewer cavities and lower mortality than those who were not on metformin. Um, TB takes a long time to treat, uh, and it's really based on the burden of organisms. So if you have smear negative, culture negative disease threat, potentially with very few organisms, you can get away with shorter duration of treatment. So this is about the efflux pumps and just showing that as you, as you treat uh, and there's a selective pressure, then the efflux pumps are induced. So if you add an efflux pump inhibitor to the antimicrobial agent, you could pro potentially kill the uh, cells. This was work done in South Africa in mice that showed that in mice, verapamil added to anti-TB therapy could reduce the relapse rate. And now we're starting a trial at a couple of sites in India uh, the other advantage of verapamil is that it concentrates in the lung, but uh, and it doesn't have effect on blood pressure in the non-hypertensive population. However, rifampicin does induce the uh, metabolism of verapamil, so that's a big problem. So you have to increase the dose of verapamil to overcome that effect. So we have to first do a dose-finding study before we can do the phase three trial. So I think finally, I just want to end... Uh, uh, there are many uh, aspects that, you know, I haven't uh, covered, obviously. Uh, many trials that are going on or that are being planned. But uh, we are planning uh, India TB Research Consortium that will bring together many partners, both within the country and outside, that could fund large projects that are focused on translation and implementation research. And a large component of that is going to be to build interest and capacity among young scientists to work on TB, because it's not something that a lot of young people uh, take up research on. And I should mention here that the report consortium, where uh, Amita Gupta is very much involved from Johns Hopkins, but it's a partnership of five US universities and five Indian uh, academic centers is uh, now turning out to be a very good platform. Essentially what it did was fund cohorts, cohorts of TB patients and their household contacts and people with latent TB infection, follow them over a period of time and have a good, well-characterized repository 
And so now that it's been a couple of years into the study, it was funded equally by the NIH and by the Department of Biotechnology in India. We now have uh, this as not only a good platform for future trials at these sites, but also a repository that could potentially be used for a lot of exploratory discovery work. So for TB, I think that this, this proverb is probably very true, that we need to work together. We need to work in partnership, basic scientists, clinical scientists, epidemiologists, um, you know, to really try to crack some of the, uh, some of the challenges that have uh, prevented us from really getting a hold of TB. And if we're really going to meet this elimination target that, the, that globally, we never talked about TB elimination. It was always about control. But I think uh, a couple of years ago, the world said, well, I think we should be more ambitious and talk about eliminating TB at least in the next 30 years or so. But there are, there are scientific uh, barriers to doing that, apart from the social and economic uh, factors that I talked about. So I think I'm going to stop there and uh, happy to take questions. <clears throat> So this is being uh, taped, so I'm going to ask people who want to ask questions to use one of the microphones here. And maybe I could ask the first one. So it was really a comprehensive talk and exciting. Um, what are the, you talked about why there's uh, MDR and XDR in India. What do you think the biggest drivers are? And are there any policy uh, uh, interventions that are being made to try to prevent MDR and XDR? Yeah, that's uh, it's a very good question. Not sure that there's an easy answer, a simple answer, because as I mentioned, a number of factors. Um, in the public sector, we've been using a, a thrice-weekly TB treatment regimen. Mm -hmm. And like I showed from our pharmacokinetic studies, we've probably been underdosing people with rifampicin. Mm -hmm. And if you're only on a, a thrice-a-week treatment and you miss one dose, mm -hmm. Uh, there's much more potential for those drug levels to drop. Mm -hmm. And that could be potentially one of the factors that, mm -hmm. that might have been driving uh, rifampicin resistance. But others are that uh, six months is a long time for people, and particularly in the private sector, people uh, drop out of treatment, there's no tracking mechanism, mm -hmm. or people take drugs when they have money to buy them and mm -hmm. may stop in between. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other thing, of course, is transmission mm -hmm. uh, that's been going on in, uh, in overcrowded settings and uh, in places where people live in small uh, mm. environments. So I think the treatment practices of pri private doctors is another very big factor. And mm -hmm. many studies have shown that uh, very poor compliance to any of the standard treatment guidelines mm -hmm. or even standard diagnostics among the private physicians. So and multiple just, levels at which yeah. one has to do the intervention. Yeah. So in terms of the what policy changes, uh, one thing is that the government of India now requires TB to be notified. So anybody mm -hmm. who treats TB, whether you're in the private or public sector, is required to notify. Mm -hmm. So that that will help to track patients. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we move now, the policy is changed to daily treatment regimen. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we would go one step further and offer free diagnostics and free treatment mm -hmm. to all TB patients. Mm -hmm. Uh, currently, that's not the case. It's only those who show up at the public sector that get free diagnostics and, and treatment. But Great. we're moving in, in that direction. And then the other important one is trying to test people for drug susceptibility right at the beginning, mm -hmm. rather than putting them through standardized courses and waiting for them to fail on treatment. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we are offering gene expert tests to everybody who's got some risk factor or the other. But eventually, in the next couple of years, it should become universal. Great. Thank you. So I know Matt, too, has a question. Uh, thank you, Samir. That was very comprehensive. Uh, obviously, these targets are very ambitious. And given your data that the, under, there's the underlying issue or, or one of the biggest risk, risk factors seems to be undernutrition. Yeah. So I know that India has had numerous projects on nut nutrition projects for children. What's being done about adults and nutrition? Well, for nutrition, there's <clears throat> basically the Food Security Act that India, the Indian Parliament approved in 2013. So this assures a certain amount of uh, food to all people living below the poverty line. So that has helped to, uh, but you know, that's not enough to uh, 
to make you well nourished. It's enough to prevent you from starving. Uh, so again, the the, the covariates or you know co-determinants of undernutrition are tribal, remote areas and uh, and poverty. So so yeah, it's the Food Security Act is the major one, but also we're looking at interventions specifically for TB, and that's been difficult because the food is not part of the health ministry. So it's very difficult for health ministry to rule out a nutrition or a food program. So you need different ministries to come together to do that. Hello, thank you. Um, so I was wondering from your perspective, if you could explain the pros and cons of BCG vaccination in India, maybe in the past 20 years, but going into the future, uh, especially regarding scaling up IPT. So um, I think, it, yeah, it's a good question because I think we need to do some more studies now because I think the studies of BCG efficacy are a little bit dated. But essentially what the big trials and, you know, our institute did the biggest vaccine trial in the world. It was 350,000 people vaccinated with BCG and three different kinds of BCG and placebo and followed for 15 years, showed no protection against adult TB. At the same time, there are systematic reviews and meta-analysis that show BCG has, does protect against disseminated disease, especially in young children, and that's why it continues to be used in the National Immunization Program. Um, and it will continue to be used, I think, till we get a better vaccine for TB because of that protection it offers in the first few years. We also know that the, sens the, uh, sens the skin sensitivity uh, wears off in a couple of years, at the most, you know, two or three years. So it doesn't really interfere with uh, it diagnoses much following that. So yeah, till we get a better vaccine, I think BCG will, it will be hard to not use it. Samia, so, mean, that was a great talk. Uh, yeah. Sanjay. Uh, so Samia, so, mean, I know in the last two weeks, there was a big um, agreement at the UN on drug resistant infections. And I, I know, I, I, I don't know, a lot of countries signed, uh, and, and they talked about multiple infections, including bacterial infections and drug resistance. And I'm, I'm pretty sure India was signatory to that treaty. Um, and they talked about committing about $2 billion over the next couple of years to prevent drug resistance, including you know, use, misuse of antibiotics. Is, do, you, do you have any thoughts on what do you think about that initiative and, and the impact maybe in India or you know, what India plans to do under that? So India is working on a number of different things as far as antimicrobial resistance is concerned. One is, of course, and the most difficult one is to regulate the sale of drugs over the counter, and um, especially TB drugs. <clears throat> a recent study done by Madhu Pai's group, Nimpati and others from the Imperial College in India showed that pharmacists are not, uh, we always thought pharmacists were giving out drugs. They are giving out a lot of antibiotics, but not anti-TB drugs. Um, so what India has done is also to regulate the use of antibiotics. So pharmacists can no longer give out an antibiotics without a prescription from the doctor. They have to keep a record. They can be inspected and shut down if they're not following that. And there's a big campaign now called the Red Line Campaign to inform consumers that if the, if the drug strip has a red line on it, then it indicates it's a drug not to be taken without a doctor's prescription. So I think a lot of community education and outreach, but also changing doctors' prescribing practices, which is, and we're working now with a network of hospitals trying to introduce the antimicrobial stewardship program. And there are also schemes now to, to support drug, uh, working with drug companies, especially with startups and young biotech entrepreneurs to develop um, new drugs. Hi, I'm Karen Thomas. Uh, I'm the Bloomberg School historian, and I very, very much enjoyed your talk. Um, I have a question about um, the rural and urban differences in, in TB uh, rates. Um, in, in the United States, uh, something kind of similar happened where, of course, in the beginning of the 20th century, TB rates were much higher in urban areas. And, but then by the mid 20th century, rates were actually highest in the um, rural areas, especially the American South. So what do you think um, the impact will be uh, since 
the rural areas have higher rates, but there's a lot of rural to urban migration mm -hmm. continuing. Yeah, it's it's hard to tell what you know what will happen. Like I said, it's also you you feel that there'll be more transmission going on in the urban areas, and um, but obviously there's more maybe more poverty in the rural areas, more undernutrition, less access to health care. So we've also found that the tribal areas are the ones with the highest rates of TB. So again, correlates with remoteness and things like that. So as these people come into urban areas, I mean, a couple of things could happen. One is that you know, they have better access to health care. They also have more employment options, maybe better nutrition. And, and so the TB rates you know, would decline. But then urban areas have their own risk factors. So <clears throat> we have to wait and see. Um, wait and see what happens. A lot to do with health systems as well. So I have two questions. One is, um, one is, can micronutrient supplementation can be integrated as part of TB therapy if, if it is difficult to, you know, administer nutrients by itself? Uh, uh, and the second question is, how are we doing in terms of maternal TB? Because both maternal health is and the TB are the biggest challenges there. Um, so those are my two questions. As far as micronutrients, there's been um, there's been no conclusive evidence that micronutrient supplementation either prevents or helps treat TB. There are trials of vitamin D that are going on even now, but we don't have conclusive evidence, so that would not be an intervention. In any case, the kind of undernutrition we are talking about, where the BMIs are so low, cannot be tackled with uh, micronutrients alone. And then what combination would you give? And so on, it's complex. What people need is a balanced diet, really. And um, the other question was about... Uh, maternal TB. Uh, yeah, maternal TB. So Amita is the expert on maternal TB. <laughs> there isn't any, uh, any s special program for maternal TB, but uh, what we have tried to do is to, uh, is to introduce some of the screening questions, because... All pregnant women are tracked. That's one program that really goes very well in India. So every pregnant woman is tracked, you know, till six weeks after she delivers. And so there's an excellent opportunity there to also make sure that, and they, you know, we're, we're screening for HIV, we're screening for diabetes. So we could very easily add TB screening to that, but it has not been done systematically. lecture. Uh, my question is, you said that only the private, uh, private uh, hospital, in private hospital, the patient can be treated uh, free, right? With public, the, yeah. yeah, public health, public uh, hospital. So what is the percentage of the, uh, the, the patient who are treated in the public health center and then private health center? It's hard to know. So there's been some modeling and some estimation. And again, re very recently there was a paper looking at drug sales data, looking at TB drug sales. And um, that paper actually estimates that there are about one and a half times more people in the private sector getting TB treatment than in the public sector. But uh, are they all really TB patients or you know, the private doctors, did they make a right diagnosis or they're just putting people on treatment? So from the drug sales data, there, so there are limitations to that kind of analysis. But, uh, but many different kinds of studies, you put them together, you, uh, it's probably at least the same number in the private sector as in the public sector. And some groups of people like children, much more in the private sector than in the public sector. Because again, availability of drugs, uh, pediatric friendly formulations and so on is limited in the public sector. Are there any more questions? Scott has a question. Um, um, so uh, I've been working with the rural population back in India, and I've realized that uh, there's a huge pocket of uh, population which goes unreported. Um, so my question is that while we are talking about these uh, treatment plans, better treatment regimes, uh, shouldn't be, uh, there be a better media, national media campaign launched against uh, tuberculosis? Uh, 
the way we launched against polio. I mean, um, what I know is that the, um, the, the advertisements have been really outdated and people really don't relate to them now. Uh, what are you, your views about it? Obviously, they can be much more. I think that there are a lot of efforts now because uh, the government has put TB on very high priority. Um, for example, there's the big campaign with Amitabh Bachchan that's aired on radio, national television, and everything. It's a TB Harega Desh Jitega campaign, so defeat TB. And, and Amitabh Bachchan, as you know, is a popular film star. I mean, there, there, there could be more, but yeah, you're right. I think. Uh, People also need to be uh, more aware. And in fact, a lot of people, uh, middle class people are the ones who don't know that TB is a problem. I think the poor have all heard of TB. They know somebody who, in their family or neighborhood who had TB. But if you talk to an, a person from an upper income group, they don't think TB is a problem in the country at all. <laughs> they think it was, we got rid of it long ago. So may, very often they used to ask me, what do you work on? You know, TB is must have disappeared many years ago from our country. So there does need to be action on all fronts. More people who should come forward, report their symptoms. We've, these prevalence surveys are now you know, telling us that the majority of people are not on treatment, even though they have TB. So we have to fix the system at different time points. And, and a large part of that is the private sector as well. So I think without engaging with them, it's going to be difficult to really um, make an uh, impact on the TB epidemiology in the country, but it's a very big challenge. How do you do that? Well, great talk, great uh, Q&A. Thank you so much for being here.